Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects by Giorgio Vasari Life of Francesco Salviati, Painter of Florence The father of Francesco Salviati, whose life we are now about to write, and who was born in the year 1510, was a good man called Michelagnolo de Rossi, a weaver of velvets. And he, having not only this child, but also many others, both male and female, and being therefore in need of assistance, had determined in his own mind that he would at all costs make Francesco devote himself to his own calling of weaving velvets. But the boy, who had turned his mind to other things, and did not like the pursuit of that trade, although in the past it had been practiced by persons, I will not say noble, but passing rich and prosperous, followed his father's wishes in that matter with no good will. Indeed, associating in the Via de Servi where his father had a house with the children of Domenico Naldini, their neighbor and an honored citizen, he showed himself all given to gentle and honorable ways, and much inclined to design in which matter he received no little assistance for a time from a cousin of his own called diacetto a young goldsmith who had a passing good knowledge of design in that he not only taught him all that he knew but also furnished him with many drawings by various able men over which Without telling his father, Francesco practiced day and night with extraordinary zeal, and Domenico Naldini, having become aware of this, first examined the boy well, and then prevailed upon his father, Michelagnolo, to place him in his uncle's shop to learn the goldsmith's art. By reason of which opportunity for design, Francesco in a few months made so much proficience that everyone was astonished. In those days, a company of young goldsmiths and painters used to assemble together at times and go throughout Florence on feast days drawing the most famous works, and not one of them labored more or with greater love than did Francesco. The young men of that company were Nanni di Prospero del Corniole, the goldsmith Francesco di Geralamo del Prato, Nenaccio di San Giorgio, and many other lads who afterwards became able men in their professions. At this time, Francesco and Giorgio Vasari, both being still boys, became fast friends, and in the following manner. In the year 1523, Silvio Passarini, Cardinal of Cortona, passing through Arezzo as the legate of Pope Clement VII, Antonio Vasari, his kinsman, took Giorgio, his eldest son, to make his reverence to the Cardinal. And the Cardinal, finding that the boy, who at that time was not more than nine years of age, had been so well grounded in his first letters by the diligence of Messer Antonio da Saccone and of Messer Giovanni Polastra, an excellent poet of Arezzo, that he knew by heart a great part of the Aeneid of Virgil, which he was pleased to hear him recite and that he had learnt to draw from Guglielmo da Marsilla, the French painter, the cardinal, I say, ordained that Antonio should himself take the boy to Florence. There Giorgio was settled in the house of Messer Niccolo Vespucci, knight of Rhodes, who lived on the abutment of the Ponte Vecchio, above the church of the Sepulcro, and was placed with Michelagnolo Buonarti. And this circumstance came to the knowledge of Francesco, who was then living in the Chiesso di Messer Bivigliano, where his father rented a great house that faced on the Vaccareccia, employing many workmen. Whereupon, since like always draws to like, he so contrived that he became the friend of Giorgio, by means of Messer Marco Dalodi, 
a gentleman of the above-named Cardinal of Cortona, who showed to Giorgio a portrait which much pleased him by the hand of Francesco, who a short time before had been placed to learn painting with Giuliano Bugiardini. Meanwhile, Vasari, not neglecting the study of letters, by order of the cardinal, spent two hours every day with Ippolito and Alessandro de Medici, under their master Pierio, an able man. And this friendship, contracted as described above between Vasari and Francesco, became such that it never ceased to bind them together although, by reason of their rivalry, and a certain somewhat haughty manner of speech that Francesco had, some persons thought otherwise. When Vesari had been some months with Michelagnolo, that excellent man was summoned to Rome by Pope Clement to receive instructions for beginning the library of San Lorenzo and he was placed by him before he departed with andrea del sarto and devoting himself under him to design giorgio was continually lending his master's drawings in secret to francesco who had no greater desire than to obtain and study them as he did day and night Afterwards, Giorgio was placed by the magnificent Ippolito with Bacchio Bandanelli, who was pleased to have the boy with him and to teach him, and Vasari contrived to obtain Francesco as his companion, with great advantage to them both, for the reason that while working together they had learned more and made greater progress in one month than they had done in two years while drawing by themselves. And the same did another young man, who was likewise working under Bandinelli at that time, called Nanocchio of the Costa San Giorgio, of whom mention was made not long ago. In the year 1527, the Medici being expelled from Florence, there was a fight for the palace of the Signoria, and a bench was thrown down from on high so as to fall upon those who were assaulting the door but as fate would have it that bench hit an arm of the david in marble by buonarti which is beside the door on the ringhiera and broke it into three pieces these pieces having remained on the ground for three days without being picked up by any one, Francesco went to the Ponte Vecchio to find Giorgio and told him his intention, and then, children as they were, they went to the piazza, and without thinking of any danger, in the midst of the soldiers of the guard, they took the pieces of that arm and carried them to the house of Michelagnolo, the father of Francesco, in the Chieso de Messer Bivigliano, from which house, having afterwards recovered them, Duke Cosimo in time caused them to be restored to their places with pegs of copper. After this, the Medici being in exile, and with them the above-mentioned Cardinal of Cortona, Antonio Vasari took his son back to Arezzo, to the no little regret of Giorgio and Francesco, who loved one another as brothers, but they did not long remain separated from each other, for the reason that, after the plague which came in the following August, had killed Giorgio's father and the best part of his family, he was so pressed with letters by Francesco, who also came very near dying of plague, that he returned to Florence. There, working with incredible zeal for a period of two years, being driven by necessity and by the desire to learn, they made marvelous proficience, having recourse, together with the above-named Nanocchio de San Giorgio, to the workshop of the painter Raffaello da Brescia, under whom Francesco, being the one who had most need to provide himself with the means to live, executed many little pictures.
Having come to the year 1529, since it did not appear to Francesco that staying in Brescia's workshop was doing him much good, he and Nanocchio went to work with Andrea del Sarto, and stayed with him all the time that the siege lasted, but in such discomfort that they repented that they had not followed Giorgio, who spent that year in Pisa with the goldsmith Mano, giving his attention for four months to the goldsmith's craft to occupy himself. Vasari, having then gone to Bologna, at the time when the Emperor Charles V was crowned there by Clement VII, Francesco, who had remained in Florence, executed on a little panel a votive picture for a soldier who had been murderously attacked in bed by certain other soldiers during the siege and although it was a paltry thing he studied it and executed it to perfection that votive picture fell not many years ago into the hands of giorgio vasari who presented it to the rev don vincenzio borghini the director of the hospital of the innocenti who holds it dear for the black friars of the badia Francesco painted three little scenes on a tabernacle of the sacrament made by the carver Tasso in the manner of a triumphal arch. In one of these is the sacrifice of Abraham, in the second the manna, and in the third the Hebrews eating the paschal lamb on their departure from Egypt, and the work was such that it gave an earnest of the success that he has since achieved. He then painted in a picture for Francesco Sartini, who sent it to France, a Delilah who was cutting off the locks of Samson, and in the distance Samson embracing the columns of the temple and bringing it down upon the Philistines, which picture made Francesco known as the most excellent of the young painters that were then in Florence. Not long afterwards, the elder Cardinal Salviati, having requested Benvenuto della Volpaia, a master of clock-making, who was in Rome at that time, to find for him a young painter who might live with him and paint some pictures for his delight, Benvenuto proposed to him Francesco, who was his friend, and whom he knew to be the most competent of all the young painters of his acquaintance, which he did all the more willingly because the cardinal had promised that he would give the young man every facility and all assistance to enable him to study. The cardinal then, liking the young Francesco's qualities, said to Benvenuto that he should send for him and give him money for that purpose. And so, when Francesco had arrived in Rome, the cardinal, being pleased with his method of working, his ways and his manners, ordained that he should have rooms in the Borgo Vecchio, and four crowns a month, with a place at the table of his gentlemen. The first works that Francesco, to whom it appeared that he had been very fortunate, executed for the cardinal, were a picture of Our Lady, which was held to be very beautiful, and a canvas of a French nobleman who is running in chase of a hind, which, flying from him, takes refuge in the temple of Diana of which work I keep the design drawn by his hand in my book in memory of him. That canvas finished, the cardinal caused him to portray, in a very beautiful picture of Our Lady, a niece of his own, married to Signor Canino Gonzaga, and likewise that lord himself. Now, while Francesco was living in Rome, with no greater desire than to see his friend Giorgio Vasari in that city, fortune was favorable to his wishes in that respect, and even more to Vasari. For Cardinal Ippolito, having parted in great anger from Pope Clement for reasons that were discussed at the time, 
but returning not long afterwards to Rome, accompanied by Bacchio Valori, in passing through Arezzo he found Giorgio, who had been left without a father, and was occupying himself as best he could. Wherefore, desiring that he should make some proficiency in art, and wishing to have him near his person, he commanded Tommaso de Nerli, who was commissary there, that he should send him to Rome as soon as he should have finished a chapel that he was painting in fresco for the monks of San Bernardo, of the order of Monte Eleveto in that city. That commission nearly executed immediately, and Giorgio, having thus arrived in Rome, went straightway to find Francesco, who joyfully described to him in what favor he was with his lord the cardinal, and how he was in a place where he could satisfy his hunger for study, adding also, Not only do I enjoy the present, but I hope for even better things. For, besides seeing you in Rome, with whom, as the young friend nearest to my heart, I shall be able to study and discuss the matters of art, I also live in hope of entering the service of Cardinal Ippolito de' Medici, from whose liberality, as well as from the favor of the Pope, I may look for greater things than I have at present." and this will happen without a doubt if a certain young man who is expected from abroad does not arrive. Giorgio, although he knew that the young man who was expected was himself, and that the place was being kept for him, yet would not reveal himself, because of a certain doubt that had entered his mind as to whether the cardinal might not have another in view and also from a wish not to declare a circumstance that might afterwards fall out differently. Giorgio had brought a letter from the above-named Commissary Nerli to the Cardinal, which, after having been five days in Rome, he had not yet presented. Finally, Giorgio and Francesco went to the palace and found in what is now the Hall of Kings Messer Marco d'Alodi, who had formerly been with the Cardinal of Cortona, as was related above, but was then in the service of Medici. To him Giorgio presented himself, saying that he had a letter from the commissary of Arezzo that was to be delivered to the Cardinal, and praying that he should give it to him, which Messer Marco was promising to do immediately when at that very moment the cardinal himself appeared there. Whereupon Giorgio, coming forward before him, presented the letter and kissed his hands, and he was received graciously, and shortly afterwards given into the charge of Jacoponi da Bibiena, the master of the household, who was commanded to provide him with rooms and with a place at the table of the pages, it appeared a strange thing to Francesco that Giorgio should not have confided the matter to him, but he was persuaded that he had done it for the best and with a good intention. When the above-named Jacoponi, therefore, had given Giorgio some rooms behind San Spirito near Francesco, the two devoted themselves in company all that winter to the study of art, with much profit leaving no noteworthy work, either in the palace or in any other part of Rome that they did not draw. And since, when the Pope was in the palace, they were not able to stay there drawing at their ease, as soon as His Holiness had ridden forth to the Magliana, as he often did, they would gain admittance by means of friends into those apartments to draw and would stay there from morning till night without eating anything but a little bread and almost freezing with cold cardinal salviati having then commanded francesco that he should paint in fresco in the chapel of his palace where he heard mass every morning some stories of the life of saint john the baptist francesco set himself to study nudes from life and Giorgio with him, in a bathhouse near there, 
and afterwards they made some anatomical studies in the Campo Santo. The spring having then come, Cardinal Ippolito, being sent by the Pope to Hungary, ordained that Giorgio should be sent to Florence, and should there execute some pictures and portraits that he had to dispatch to Rome. But in the July following, what with the fatigues of the past winter and the heat of summer, Giorgio fell ill and was carried by litter to Arezzo, to the great sorrow of Francesco, who also fell sick and was like to die. However, being restored to health, Francesco was commissioned by Maestro Filippo da Siena at the instance of Antonio Labaco, a master worker in wood, to paint in fresco in a niche over the door at the back of Santa Maria della Pace, a Christ speaking with San Filippo, and in two angles the Virgin and the Angel of the Annunciation which pictures much pleasing Maestro Filippo were the reason that he caused him to paint the Assumption of Our Lady in the same place, in a large square space that was not yet painted in one of the eight sides of that temple. Whereupon Francesco, reflecting that he had to execute that work not merely in a public place, but in a place where there were pictures by the rarest masters, Raffaello d'Arbino, Rosso, Baldassare da Siena, and others, put all possible study and diligence into executing it in oils on the wall, so that it proved to be a beautiful picture, and was much extolled. And excellent among other figures is held to be the portrait that he painted there of the above-named Maestro Filippo with the hands clasped. And since Francesco lived, as has been told, with Cardinal Salviati, and was known as his protégé, he began to be called and known by no other name but Cecino Salviati, and he kept that name to the day of his death. Pope Clement the Seventh being dead, and Paul the Third elected, Messer Bindo Altoviti caused Francesco to paint on the façade of his house at the Ponte Sant'Agnolo the arms of the new pontiff with some large nude figures which gave infinite satisfaction. About the same time he made a portrait of that Messer Bindo which was a very good figure and a beautiful portrait and this was afterwards sent to his villa of San Mizano in the Valdarno, where it still is. He then painted for the church of San Francesco Aripa a very beautiful altar picture of the Annunciation in Oils, which was executed with the greatest diligence. For the coming of Charles V to Rome in the year 1535, he painted for Antonio de San Gallo some scenes in Chioscuro, which were placed on the arch that was made at San Marco, and these pictures, as has been said in another place, were the best that there were in all those festive decorations. Afterwards, Signor Pier Luigi Farnese, who had been made Lord of Nepi at that time, wishing to adorn that city with new buildings and pictures, took Francesco into his service, giving him rooms in the Belvedere. And there Francesco painted for him, on large canvases, some scenes in gouache of the actions of Alexander the Great, which were afterwards carried into execution and woven into tapestries in Flanders. For the same Lord of Nepi, he decorated a large and very beautiful bathroom with many scenes and figures executed in fresco. Then the same Lord, having been created Duke of Castro, for his first entry, rich and most beautiful decorations were made in that city under the direction of Francesco, and at the gate an arch all covered with scenes, figures, and statues, executed with much judgment by able men, 
and in particular by Alessandro, called Cerano, a sculptor of Settignano. Another arch in the form of a façade was made at the Petrone, and yet another on the Piazza, which arches, with regard to the woodwork, were executed by Battista Botticelli and in these festive preparations, among other things, Francesco made a beautiful perspective scene for a comedy that was performed. About the same time, Giulio Camillo, who was then in Rome, having made a book of his compositions in order to send it to King Francis of France, had it all illustrated by Francesco Salviati, who put into it all the diligence that it is possible to devote to such a work. Cardinal Salviati, having a desire to possess a picture in tinted woods, that is, in Tarsia, by the hand of Fra Damiano da Bergamo, a lay brother of San Domenico at Bologna, sent him a design done in red chalk by the hand of Francesco, as a pattern for its execution, which design, representing King David being anointed by Samuel, was the best thing that Cecchino Salviati ever drew, and truly most rare. After this, Giovanni da Separello and Battista Gabo of San Gallo, who had caused the Florentine painter Jacopo del Conte then a young man, to paint in the Florentine Company of the Misericordia in San Giovanni Decolato, under the Campidoglio at Rome, namely, in the second church, where they hold their assemblies, a story of that same St. John the Baptist, showing the angel appearing to Zacharias in the temple commissioned Francesco to paint below that scene another story of the same saint, namely, the visitation of Our Lady to St. Elizabeth. That work, which was finished in the year 1538, he executed in fresco in such a manner that it is worthy to be numbered among the most graceful and best-conceived pictures that Francesco ever painted in the invention, in the composition of the scene, in the method, and the attention to rules for the gradation of the figures, in the perspective, and the architecture of the buildings, in the nudes, in the draped figures, in the grace of the heads, and, in short, in every part. Wherefore, it is no marvel if all Rome was struck with astonishment by it. Around a window he executed some bizarre fantasies in imitation of marble, and some little scenes that have marvelous grace. And since Francesco never wasted any time, while he was engaged on that work, he executed many other things, and also drawings, and he colored a phaethon with the horses of the sun which Michelagnolo had drawn. All these things Salviati showed to Giorgio, who, after the death of Duke Alessandro, had gone to Rome for two months, saying to him that, once he had finished a picture of a young St. John that he was painting for his master, Cardinal Salviati, a passion of Christ on canvas that was to be sent to Spain, and a picture of Our Lady that he was painting for Raffaello Acaioli. He wished to turn his steps to Florence in order to revisit his native place, his relatives, and his friends, for his father and mother were still alive, to whom he was always of the greatest assistance, and particularly in settling two sisters, one of whom was married, and the other is a nun in the convent of Monte Domini. Coming thus to Florence, where he was received with much rejoicing by his relatives and friends, it chanced that he arrived there at the very moment when the festive preparations were being made for the nuptials of Duke Cosimo and the Lady Donna Leonora de Toledo wherefore he was commissioned to paint one of the already-mentioned scenes that were executed in the courtyard, 
which he accepted very willingly, and that was the one in which the emperor was placing the ducal crown on the head of Duke Cosimo. But being seized before he had finished it with a desire to go to Venice, Francesco left it to Carlo Portelli of Loro, who finished it after Francesco's design, which design, with many others by the same hand, is in our book. Having departed from Florence and made his way to Bologna, Francesco found there Giorgio Vasari, who had returned two days before from Camaldoli, where he had finished the two altarpieces that are in the tramezzo of the church, and had begun that of the high altar, and Vasari was arranging to paint three great panel pictures for the refectory of the fathers of San Michel in Bosco, where he kept Francesco with him for two days. During that time, some of his friends made efforts to obtain for him the commission for an altarpiece that was to be allotted by the men of the Della Morte Hospital. But although Salviati made a most beautiful design, those men, having little understanding, were not able to recognize the opportunity that Messer Domenedio had sent them of obtaining for Bologna a work by the hand of an able master. Wherefore, Francesco went away in some disdain, leaving some very beautiful designs in the hands of Girolamo Fagioli, to the end that he might engrave them on copper and have them printed. Having arrived in Venice, he was received courteously by the patriarch Grimani and his brother Messer Vettorio, who showed him a thousand favors. For that patriarch, after a few days, he painted in oils, in an octagon of four brachia, a most beautiful psyche to whom, as to a goddess, on account of her beauty, incense and votive offerings are presented, which octagon was placed in a hall in the house of that lord, wherein is a ceiling in the center of which there curve some festoons executed by Camelo Mantovano, an excellent painter in representing landscapes, flowers, leaves, fruits, and other such-like things. That octagon, I say, was placed in the midst of four pictures, each two brachia and a half square, executed with stories of the same psyche as was related in the life of Genga by Francesco da Forli, and the octagon is not only beyond all comparison more beautiful than those four pictures, but even the most beautiful work of painting that there is in all Venice. After that, in a chamber wherein Giovanni Ricamatori of Udine had executed many works in stucco, he painted some little figures in fresco, both nude and draped, which are full of grace. In like manner, in an altarpiece that he executed for the nuns of the Corpus Domini at Venice, he painted with much diligence a dead Christ with the Maries, and in the air an angel who has the mysteries of the Passion in the hands. He made the portrait of Messer Pietro Aretino, which, as a rare work, was sent by that poet to King Francis, with some verses in praise of him who had painted it. And for the nuns of San Cristina in Bologna, of the order of Camaldoli, the same Salviati, at the entreaty of Don Giovanni Francesco de Bagno, their confessor, painted an altarpiece with many figures, a truly beautiful picture, which is in the church of that convent. Then, having grown weary of the life in Venice, as one who remembered that of Rome, and considering that it was no place for men of design, Francesco departed in order to return to Rome, and so making a detour by Verona and Mantua, in the first of which places he saw the many antiquities that are there, 
and in the other the works of Giulio Romano. He made his way back to Rome by the road through Romagna, and arrived there in the year 1541. There, having rested a little, the first works that he made were the portrait of Messer Giovanni Gaddi and that of Messer Annibale Caro, who were much his friends. Those finished, he painted a very beautiful altar-piece for the chapel of the clerks of the chamber in the Pope's palace. And in the church of the Germans he began a chapel in fresco for a merchant of that nation painting on the vault above the apostles receiving the Holy Spirit, and in a picture that is halfway up the wall, Jesus Christ rising from the dead, with the soldiers sleeping round the sepulchre in various attitudes, foreshortened in a bold and beautiful manner. On one side he painted St. Stephen, and on the other side St. George, in two niches, and at the foot he painted San Giovanni Nemocenario, who is giving alms to a naked beggar, with a charity on one side of him, and on the other Sant'Alberto, the Carmelite friar, between logic and prudence. And in the great altar picture, finally, he painted in fresco the dead Christ with the Maries. Having formed a friendship with Piero di Marconi, a Florentine goldsmith, and having become his gossip, Francesco made to Piero's wife, who was also his gossip, after her delivery, a present of a very beautiful design, which was to be painted on one of those round baskets in which food is brought to a newly delivered woman. In that design there was the life of man, in a number of square compartments containing very beautiful figures, both on one side and on the other, namely all the ages of human life, each of which rested on a different festoon, appropriate to the particular age and the season. In that bizarre composition were included in two long ovals figures of the sun and moon, and between them Sais, a city of Egypt, standing before the temple of the goddess Pallas, and praying for wisdom, as if to signify that on behalf of newborn children one should pray before any other thing for wisdom and goodness. That design Piero held ever afterwards as dear as if it had been, as indeed it was, a most beautiful jewel. Not long afterwards, the above-named Piero and other friends, having written to Francesco that he would do well to return to his native place, for the reason that it was held to be certain that he would be employed by the Lord Duke Cosimo, who had no masters about him, save such as were slow and irresolute, he finally determined, trusting much also in the favor of Messer Alamano, the brother of the cardinal and uncle of the duke, to return to Florence. Having arrived, therefore, before attempting any other thing, he painted for the above-named Messer Alamano Salviati a very beautiful picture of Our Lady, which he executed in a room in the office of works of Santa Maria del Fiore, that was occupied by Francesco del Prato, who at that time, from being a goldsmith and a master of Tosia, had set himself to casting little figures in bronze and to painting, with much profit and honor. In that same place, then, which that master held as the official in charge of the woodwork of the Office of Works, Francesco made portraits of his friend Piero de Marconi and of Aveduto del Seguia, the dresser of Miniver Furs, who was also much his friend, which Aveduto, besides many other things, by the hand of Francesco that he possesses, has a portrait of Francesco himself, executed in oils with his own hand, and very lifelike.
The above-mentioned picture of Our Lady, being, after it was finished, in the shop of the woodcarver Tasso, who was then architect of the palace, was seen by many persons and vastly extolled. But what caused it even more to be considered a rare picture was that Tasso, who was accustomed to censure almost everything, praised it to the skies. And what was more, he said to Messer Pier Francesco, the major domo, that it would be an excellent thing for the duke to give Francesco some work of importance to execute. Whereupon Messer Pier Francesco and Cristofano Rinieri, who had the ear of the duke, played their part in such a way that Messer Alamano spoke to his excellency, saying to him that Francesco desired to be commissioned to paint the Hall of Audience, which is in front of the chapel of the ducal palace, and that he cared nothing about payment and the duke was content that this should be granted to him. Whereupon Francesco, having made small designs of the triumph of Furious Camillus and of many stories of his life, set himself to contrive the division of that hall, according to the spaces left by the windows and doors, some of which are high and some low, and there was no little difficulty in making that division in such a way that it might be well ordered and might not disturb the sequence of the stories. In the wall where there is the door by which one enters into the hall, there were two large spaces divided by the door. Opposite to that, where there are the three windows that look out over the piazza, there were four spaces, but not wider than about three braccia each. In the end wall that is on the right hand as one enters, wherein are two windows that likewise look out on the piazza, but in another direction, there were three similar spaces, each about three braccia wide. And in the end wall that is on the left hand, opposite to the other, what with the marble door that leads into the chapel, and a window with a grating of bronze, there remained only one space large enough to contain a work of importance. On the wall of the chapel, then, within an ornament of Corinthian columns that support an architrave, which has below it a recess, wherein hang two very rich festoons and two pendants of various fruits counterfeited very well while upon it sits a naked little boy who is holding the ducal arms namely those of the houses of medici and toledo he painted two scenes on the right hand camillus who is commanding that the schoolmaster shall be given up to the vengeance of his young scholars, and on the other the same Camillus, while the army is in combat and fire is burning the stockades and tents of the camp, is routing the Gauls. And besides that, where the same range of pilasters continues, he painted a figure of opportunity, large as life, who has seized fortune by the locks, and some devices of his excellency, with many ornaments executed with marvellous grace. On the main wall, where there are two great spaces divided by the principal door, he painted two large and very beautiful scenes. In the first are the Gauls, who, weighing the gold of the tribute, add to it a sword, to the end that the weight may be the greater, and Camillus, full of rage, delivers himself from the tribute by force of arms, which scene is very beautiful, and crowded with figures, landscapes, antiquities, and vases counterfeited very well, and in various manners in imitation of gold and silver. In the other scene, beside the first, is Camillus in the triumphal chariot, drawn by four horses, and on high is Fame who is crowning him. Before the chariot are priests very richly apparelled, with the statue of the goddess Juno, 
and holding vases in their hands, and with some trophies and spoils of great beauty. About the chariot are innumerable prisoners in various attitudes, and behind it the soldiers of the army in their armor, among whom Francesco made a portrait of himself, which is so good that it seems as if alive. In the distance, where the triumphal procession is passing, is a very beautiful picture of Rome, and above the door is a figure of peace in Chioscuro, who is burning the arms with some prisoners, all which was executed by Francesco with such diligence and study that there is no more beautiful work to be seen. On the wall towards the west he painted in a niche in one of the larger spaces in the center a Mars in armor, and below that a nude figure representing a gull with a crest on the head similar to that of a cock, and in another niche a Diana with a skin about her waist, who is drawing an arrow from her quiver with a dog. In the two corners next the other two walls are two figures of time, one adjusting weights in a balance, and the other tempering the liquid in two vases by pouring one into the other. On the last wall, which is opposite to the chapel and faces towards the north, in a corner on the right hand, is the sun figured in the manner wherein the Egyptians represent him and in the other corner the moon in the same manner. In the middle is favor, represented as a nude young man on the summit of the wheel, with envy, hatred, and malice on one side, and on the other side honors, pleasure, and all the other things described by Lucian. Above the windows is a frieze, all full of most beautiful nudes, as large as life, and in various forms and attitudes, with some scenes likewise from the life of Camillus. And opposite to the piece that is burning the arms is the river Arno, who, holding a most abundant horn of plenty, raises with one hand a curtain, and reveals Florence and the greatness of her pontiffs and the heroes of the house of Medici. He painted there, besides all that, a base that runs round below those scenes, and niches with some terminal figures of women that support festoons, and in the center are certain ovals with scenes of people adorning a sphinx and the river Arno. Francesco put into the execution of that work all the diligence and study that are possible and although he had many contradictions he carried it to a happy conclusion desiring to leave in his native city a work worthy of himself and of so great a prince francesco was by nature melancholy and for the most part he did not care to have any one about him when he was at work but nevertheless, when he first began that undertaking, almost doing violence to his nature, and affecting an open heart, with great cordiality he allowed Tasso and others of his friends, who had done him some service, to stand and watch him at work, showing them every courtesy that he was able. But when he had gained a footing at court, as the saying goes, and it seemed to him that he was in good favor, returning to his choleric and biting nature, he paid them no attention. Nay, what was worse, he used the most bitter words according to his wont, which served as an excuse to his adversaries, censuring and decrying the works of others and praising himself and his own works to the skies. These methods, which displeased most people, and likewise certain craftsmen, brought upon him such odium that Tasso and many others, who from being his friends had become his enemies, began to give him cause for thought and for action.
for although they praised the excellence of the art that was in him, and the facility and rapidity with which he executed his works so well and with such unity, they were not at a loss, on the other hand, for something to censure. And since, if they had allowed him to gain a firm footing and to settle his affairs, they would not have been able afterwards to hinder or hurt him. They began in good time to give him trouble and to molest him. Whereupon many of the craftsmen and others, banding themselves together and forming a faction, began to disseminate among the people of importance a rumor that Salviati's work was not succeeding, and that he was laboring by mere skill of hand, and devoting no study to anything that he did in which, in truth, they accused him wrongly, for although he never toiled over the execution of his works, as they themselves did, yet that did not mean that he did not study them, and that his works had not infinite grace and invention, or that they were not carried out excellently well. Not being able to surpass his excellence with these works, those adversaries wish to overwhelm it with such words and reproaches. But in the end, truth and excellence have too much force. At first, Francesco made light of such rumors. But later, perceiving that they were growing beyond all reason, he complained of it many times to the duke. But since it began to be seen that the duke, to all appearance, was not showing him such favors as he would have liked, and it seemed that his excellency cared nothing for those complaints, Francesco began to fall from his position in such a manner that his adversaries, taking courage from that, sent forth a rumor that his scenes in the hall were to be thrown to the ground because they did not give satisfaction, and had in them no particle of excellence. All these calumnies, which were pressed against him with incredible envy and malice by his adversaries, had reduced Francesco to such a state, that if it had not been for the goodness of Messer Lelio Torelli, Messer Peschino Bertini, and others of his friends, he would have retreated before them, which was exactly what they desired. But the above-named friends, exhorting him continually to finish the work of the hall, and others that he had in hand, restrained him, even as was done by many other friends not in Florence, to whom he wrote of these persecutions and Giorgio Vasari, among others, answering a letter that Salviati wrote to him on the matter, exhorted him always to have patience, because excellence is refined by persecution as gold by fire, adding that a time was about to come when his art and his genius would be recognized, and that he should complain of no one but himself, in that he did not yet know men's humors and how the people and the craftsmen of his own country were made. Thus, notwithstanding all these contradictions and persecutions that poor Francesco suffered, he finished that hall, namely, the work that he had undertaken to execute in fresco on the walls, for the reason that on the ceiling, or rather soffit, there was no need for him to do any painting, since it was so richly carved, and all overlaid with gold, that among works of that kind there is none more beautiful to be seen." and as a finish to the hull, the duke caused two new windows of glass to be made, with his devices and arms, and those of Charles V, and nothing could be better in that kind of work than the manner in which they were executed by Battista del Boro, an Aretine painter excellent in that field of art. After that, Francesco painted for His Excellency the ceiling of the hall where he dines in winter, with many devices and little figures in distemper, and a most beautiful study which opens out over the green chamber. 
he made portraits likewise of some of the duke's children, and one year for the carnival he executed in the great hall the scenery and prospect view for a comedy that was performed, and that with such beauty and in a manner so different from those that had been done in Florence up to that time that they were judged to be superior to them all. Nor is this to be marveled at, since it is very certain that Francesco was always in all his works full of judgment, and well varied and fertile in invention, and what is more, he had a perfect knowledge of design, and had a more beautiful manner than any other painter in Florence at that time, and handled colors with great skill and delicacy. He also made a head, or rather a portrait, of Signor Giovanni de' Medici, the father of Duke Cosimo, which was very beautiful, and it is now in the guardaroba of the same Lord Duke. For Cristofano Rinieri, who was much his friend, he painted a most beautiful picture of Our Lady, which is now in the Udienza della Decima. For Ridolfo Landi, he executed a picture of charity, which could not be more lovely than it is. And for Simone Corsi, likewise, he painted a picture of Our Lady, which was much extolled. For Messer Donato Acquaioli, a knight of Rhodes, with whom he always maintained a particular intimacy, he executed certain little pictures that are very beautiful and he also painted in an altar-piece Christ showing to St. Thomas, who would not believe that he had newly risen from the dead, the marks of the blows and wounds that he had received from the Jews, which altar-piece was taken by Tommaso Guardani into France and placed in the chapel of the Florentines in a church at Lyon. Francesco also depicted, at the request of the above-named Cristofano Rinieri and of Maestro Giovanni Rosto, the Flemish master of tapestry, the whole story of Tarquinius and the Roman Lucretia in many cartoons, which, being afterwards put into execution in tapestries woven in silk, floss silk and gold, proved to be a marvelous work which hearing the duke, who was at that time having similar tapestries, all in silk and gold, made in Florence by the same Maestro Giovanni for the Sala de Dugento, and had caused cartoons with the stories of the Hebrew Joseph to be executed by Bronzino and Pantormo, as has been related, commanded that Francesco also should make a cartoon which was that with the interpretation of the dream of the seven fat and seven lean kine. Into that cartoon Francesco put all the diligence that could possibly be devoted to such a work, and that is required for pictures that are to be woven, for there must be fantastic inventions and variety of composition in the figures and these must stand out from another so that they may have strong relief and they must come out bright in colouring and rich in the costumes and vestments that piece of tapestry and the others having turned out well his excellency resolved to establish the art in florence and caused it to be taught to some boys who having grown to be men are now executing most excellent works for the duke Francesco also executed a most beautiful picture of Our Lady, likewise in oils, which is now in the chamber of Messer Alessandro, the son of Messer Ottaviano de Medici. For the above-named Messer Pasquino Bertini, he painted on canvas yet another picture of Our Lady, with Christ and St. John as little children, who are smiling over a parrot that they have in their hands, which was a very pleasing and fanciful work. 
and for the same man he made a most beautiful design of a crucifix about one brachio high, with a magdalene at the foot, in a manner so new and so pleasing that it is a marvel, which design Messer Salvestro Bertini lent to Girolamo Razzi, his very dear friend, who is now Don Silvano and two pictures were painted from it by Carlo of Loro, who has since executed many others which are dispersed about Florence. Giovanni and Piero d'Agostino Dini had erected in San Croce, on the right hand as one enters by the central door, a very rich chapel of grey sandstone, and a tomb for Agostino and others of their family and they gave the commission for the altarpiece of that chapel to francesco who painted in it christ taken down from the cross by joseph of arimathea and nicodemus and at the foot the madonna in a swoon with mary magdalene st john and the other maries that altarpiece was executed by Francesco with so much art and study that not only the nude Christ is very beautiful, but all the other figures likewise are well disposed and colored with relief and force, and although at first the picture was censured by Francesco's adversaries, nevertheless it won him a great name with men in general and those who have painted others after him out of emulation have not surpassed him the same francesco before he departed from florence painted the portrait of the above-mentioned messer lelio torelli and some other works of no great importance of which i know not the particulars but among other things he brought to completion a design of the conversion of St. Paul that he had drawn long before in Rome, which is very beautiful, and he had it engraved on copper in Florence by Ania Vico of Parma, and the Duke was content to retain him in Florence until that should be done with his usual salary and allowances. During that time, which was in the year 1548, Giorgio Vasari, being at Rimini in order to execute in fresco and in oils the works of which we have spoken in another place, Francesco wrote him a long letter, informing him in exact detail how his affairs were passing in Florence and in particular that he had made a design for the principal chapel of San Lorenzo which was to be painted by order of the lord duke but that with regard to that work infinite mischief had been done against him with his excellency and among other things that he held it almost as certain that messer pier francesco the major domo had not presented his design so that the work had been allotted to pantormo and finally he said that for these reasons he was returning to Rome, much dissatisfied with the men and the craftsmen of his native country. Having thus returned to Rome, he bought a house near the palace of Cardinal Farnese, and while he was occupying himself with executing some works of no great importance, he received from that cardinal through messer annibali caro and don giulio clovio the commission to paint the chapel of the palace of san giorgio in which he executed an ornament of most beautiful compartments in stucco and a vaulting in fresco with stories of st lawrence and many figures full of grace and on a panel of stone in oils the nativity of christ introducing into that work which was very beautiful the portrait of the above-named cardinal then having another work allotted to him in the above-mentioned company of the misericordia where jacopo del conte had painted the preaching and the baptism of st john in which although he had not surpassed francesco he had acquitted himself very well and where some other works had been executed 
by the Venetian Battista Franco and by Piero Ligorio. Francesco painted on that part that is exactly beside his own picture of the visitation, the nativity of St. John, which, although he executed it excellently well, was nevertheless not equal to the first. At the head of that company, likewise, he painted for Messer Bartolomeo Busatti two very beautiful figures in fresco, St. Andrew and St. Bartholomew, the apostles, which are one on either side of the altarpiece, wherein is a deposition from the cross by the hand of the same Jacopo del Cante, which is a very good picture and the best work that he had ever done up to that time. In the year 1550, Julius the Third, having been elected Supreme Pontiff, Francesco painted some very beautiful scenes in Chioscuro for the arch that was erected above the steps of San Pietro, among the festive preparations for the coronation and then in the same year a sepulchre with many steps and ranges of columns having been made in the minerva by the company of the sacrament francesco painted upon it some scenes and figures in terretta which were held to be very beautiful in a chapel of San Lorenzo in Damaso, he executed two angels in fresco that are holding a canopy, the design of one of which is in our book. In the refectory of San Salvador del Loro at Monte Giordano, on the principal wall, he painted in fresco, with a great number of figures, the marriage of Cana in Galilee at which Jesus Christ turned water into wine, and at the sides some saints, with Pope Eugenius IV, who belonged to that order, and other founders. Above the door of that refectory, on the inner side, he painted a picture in oils of St. George killing the dragon, and he executed that whole work with much mastery, finish, and charm of coloring. About the same time he sent to Florence for Messer Alamano Salviati a large picture in which are Adam and Eve beside the tree of life in the earthly paradise, eating the forbidden fruit, which is a very beautiful work. For Signor Ranuccio, Cardinal Sant'Agnolo of the house of Farnese, Francesco painted with most beautiful fantasy, two walls in the hall that is in front of the great hall in the Farnese Palace. On one wall he depicted Signor Ranuccio, the elder, receiving from Eugenius the Fourth his baton as captain-general of Holy Church, with some virtues, and on the other Pope Paul the Third of the Farnese family, who is giving the baton of the church to Signor Pierluigi, while there is seen approaching from a distance the Emperor Charles V, accompanied by Cardinal Alessandro Farnese, and by other lords portrayed from life. And on that wall, besides the things described above and many others, he painted a fame and a number of other figures which are executed very well. It is true, indeed, that the work received its final completion not from him, but from Tadeo Zucchero of Sant'Agnolo, as will be related in the proper place. He gave completion and proportion to the chapel of the Popolo, which Fra Sebastiano Veneziano had formerly begun for Agostino Cigi, but had not finished and Francesco finished it, as has been described in the life of Fra Sebastiano. For Cardinal Riccio of Montepulciano, he painted a most beautiful hall in his palace in the Strada Giulia, where he executed in fresco various pictures with many stories of David, and among others, one of Bathsheba bathing herself in a bath, with many other women, while David stands gazing at her, is a scene very well composed and full of grace, 
and as rich in invention as any other that there is to be seen. In another picture is the death of Uriah, in a third the ark, before which go many musical instruments, and finally, after some others, a battle that is being fought between David and his enemies, very well composed, and, to put it briefly, the work of that hall is all full of grace, of most beautiful fantasies, and of many fanciful and ingenious inventions. The distribution of the parts is done with much consideration, and the coloring is very pleasing. To tell the truth, Francesco, feeling himself bold and fertile in invention, and having a hand obedient to his brain, would have liked always to have on his hands works large and out of the ordinary, and for no other reason was he strange in his dealings with his friends, save only for this, that, being variable, and in certain things not very stable, what pleased him one day he hated the next, and he did few works of importance without having in the end to contend about the price on which account he was avoided by many. After these works, Andrea Tassini, having to send a painter to the King of France, in the year 1554, sought out Giorgio Vasari, but in vain, for he said that not for any salary, however great, or promises or expectations, would he leave the service of his lord, Duke Cosimo. And finally Andrea came to terms with Francesco, and took him to France, undertaking to recompense him in Rome, if he were not satisfied in France. Before Francesco departed from Rome, as if he thought that he would never return, he sold his house, his furniture, and every other thing, excepting the offices that he held. But the venture did not succeed as he had expected, for the reason that, on arriving in Paris, where he was received kindly, and with many courtesies by Messer Francesco Primaticcio, painter and architect to the king, and abbot of St. Martin, he was straightway recognized, so it is said, as the strange sort of man that he was, for he saw no work either by Rosso or by any other master that he did not censure either openly or in some subtle way. Everyone, therefore, expecting some great work from him, he was set by the Cardinal of Lorraine, who had sent for him to execute some pictures in his palace at Dampierre, whereupon, after making many designs, finally he set his hand to the work and executed some pictures with scenes in fresco over the cornices of chimney pieces and a little study full of scenes which are said to have shown great mastery. But whatever may have been the reason, these works did not win him much praise. Besides that, Francesco was never much liked there, because he had a nature altogether opposed to that of the men of that country, where, even as those merry and jovial men are liked and held dear, who live a free life, and take part gladly in assemblies and banquets, so those are, I do not say shunned, but less liked and welcomed, who are by nature, as Francesco was, melancholy, abstinent, sickly, and cross-grained. For some things he might have deserved to be excused, since his habit of body would not allow him to mix himself up with banquets and with eating and drinking too much if only he could have been more agreeable in conversation. And, what was worse, whereas it was his duty, according to the custom of that country and that court, to show himself and pay court to others, he would have liked and thought that he deserved to be himself courted by everyone. In the end, the king being occupied with matters of war, and likewise the cardinal, and himself being disappointed of his salary and promised benefits, Francesco, after having been there twenty months, resolved to return to Italy, 
and so he made his way to Milan, where he was courteously received by the Chevalier Leone Aretino in the house that he has built for himself, very ornate and all filled with statues ancient and modern, and with figures cast in gesso from rare works, as will be told in another place. And after having stayed there a fortnight and rested himself, he went on to Florence. There he found Giorgio Vasari, and told him how well he had done not to go to France, giving him an account that would have driven the desire to go there, no matter how great, out of any one. From Florence he returned to Rome, and there entered an action against those who had guaranteed his allowances from the Cardinal of Lorraine, and compelled them to pay him in full. And when he had received the money, he bought some offices, in addition to others that he held before, with a firm resolve to look after his own life, knowing that he was not in good health, and that he had wholly ruined his constitution. Notwithstanding that, he would have liked to be employed in great works, but in this he did not succeed so readily, and he occupied himself for a time with executing pictures and portraits. Pope Paul IV having died, Pius was elected, likewise the fourth of that name, who, much delighting in building, availed himself of Piero Ligorio in matters of architecture and his holiness ordained that cardinals alessandro farnese and emulio should cause the great hall called the hall of kings to be finished by daniello da volterra who had begun it that very reverend farnese did his utmost to obtain the half of that work for francesco and in consequence there was a long contention between daniello and francesco particularly because Michelagnolo Buonarti exerted himself in favor of Daniello, and for a time they arrived at no conclusion. Meanwhile, Vasari, having gone with Cardinal Giovanni de' Medici, the son of Duke Cosimo, to Rome, Francesco related to him his many difficulties, and in particular that in which, for the reasons just given, he then found himself and Giorgio, who much loved the excellence of the man, showed him that up to that time he had managed his affairs very badly, and that for the future he should let him, Vasari, manage them, for he would so contrive that in one way or another the half of that hall of kings would fall to him to execute, which Daniello was not able to finish by himself being a slow and irresolute person, and almost certainly not as able and versatile as Francesco. Matters standing thus, and nothing more being done for the moment, not many days afterwards Giorgio himself was requested by the Pope to paint part of that hall but he answered that he had one three times larger to paint in the palace of his master, Duke Cosimo, and in addition that he had been so badly treated by Pope Julius the Third, for whom he had executed many labors in the Vigna on the Monte and elsewhere, that he no longer knew what to expect from certain kinds of men adding that he had painted for the palace of the same pontiff without being paid an altarpiece of Christ calling Peter and Andrew from their nets on the Sea of Tiberias, which had been taken away by Pope Paul IV from a chapel that Julius had built over the corridor of the Belvedere, and which was to be sent to Milan and that his holiness should cause it to be either paid for or restored to him. To which the Pope said in answer, and whether it was true or not I do not know, that he knew nothing of that altarpiece, but wished to see it. Whereupon it was sent for, and after his holiness had seen it, but in a bad light, he was content that it should be restored.
The discussion about the hall being then resumed, Giorgio told the Pope frankly that Francesco was the first and best painter in Rome, that His Holiness would do well to employ him, since no one could serve him better, and that, although Bornarti and the Cardinal of Carpi favored Daniello, they did so more from the motive of friendship and, perhaps, out of animosity than for any other reason. But to return to the altarpiece, Giorgio had no sooner left the Pope than he sent it to the house of Francesco, who afterwards had it taken to Arezzo, where, as we have related in another place, it has been deposited by Vasari with a rich, costly, and handsome ornament in the Pieve of that city. The affairs of the Hall of Kings remaining in the condition that has been described above when Duke Cosimo departed from Siena in order to go to Rome, Vasari, who had gone as far as that with his excellency, recommended Salviati warmly to him, beseeching him to make interest on his behalf with the Pope, and to Francesco he wrote as to all that he was to do when the Duke had arrived in Rome in all which Francesco departed in no way from the advice given him by Giorgio, for he went to do reverence to the Duke, and was welcomed by His Excellency with an aspect full of kindness, and shortly afterwards so much was said to His Holiness on his behalf that the half of the above-mentioned hall was allotted to him. Setting his hand to the work, before doing any other thing, he threw to the ground a scene that had been begun by Daniello, on which account there were afterwards many contentions between them. The pontiff was served in matters of architecture, as has been already related by Piero Ligorio, who at first had much favored Francesco, and would have continued to favor him, but Francesco paying no more attention either to Piro or to any other after he had begun to work. This was the reason that Ligorio, from being his friend, became in a certain sort his adversary, and of this very manifest signs were seen, for Piro began to say to the Pope that since there were many young painters of ability in Rome, and he wished to have that hall off his hands, it would be a good thing to allot one scene to each of them, and thus to see it finished once and for all. These proceedings of Piro's, to which it was evident that the Pope was favorable, so displeased Francesco, that in great disdain he retired from the work and all the contentions, considering that he was held in little estimation. And so, mounting his horse, and not saying a word to any one, he went off to Florence, where, like the strange creature that he was, without giving a thought to any of the friends that he had there, he took up his abode in an inn, as if he did not belong to the place, and had no acquaintance there, nor any one who cared for him in any way. Afterwards, having kissed the hands of the duke, he was received with such kindness that he might well have looked for some good result, if only he had been different in nature and had adhered to the advice of Giorgio, who urged him to sell the offices that he had in Rome and to settle in Florence so as to enjoy his native place with his friends and to avoid the danger of losing, together with his life, all the fruits of his toil and grievous labors. But Francesco, moved by sensitiveness and anger, and by his desire to avenge himself, resolved that he would at all costs return to Rome in a few days. Meanwhile, moving from that inn at the entreaty of his friends, he retired to the house of Messer Marco Finali, the prior of Sant'Apostolo where he executed a pietà in colors on cloth of silver for Messer Jacopo Salviati, as it were to pass the time with the Madonna and the other Maries, which was a very beautiful work. 
he renewed in colors a medallion with the ducal arms which he had made on a former occasion and placed over a door in the palace of messer alamano and for the above-named messer jacopo he made a most beautiful book of bizarre costumes and various headdresses of men and horses for masquerades for which he received innumerable courtesies from the liberality of that lord who lamented the strange and eccentric nature of francesco whom he was never able to attract into his house on this occasion as he had done at other times finally francesco being about to set out for rome giorgio as his friend reminded him that being rich advanced in years weak in health and little fitted for more fatigues he should think of living in peace and shun strife and contention which he would have been able to do with ease having acquired honour and property in plenty if he had not been too avaricious and desirous of gain he exhorted him in addition to sell the greater part of the offices that he possessed and to arrange his affairs in such a manner that in any emergency or any misfortune that might happen he might be able to remember his friends and those who had given him faithful and loving service francesco promised that he would do right both in word and deed and confessed that giorgio had spoken the truth but as happens to most of the men who think that time will last for ever he did nothing more in the matter having arrived in rome francesco found that cardinal emulio had distributed the scenes of the hall giving two of them to tadeo zucchero of sant'agnolo one to livio da forli another to orazio da bologna yet another to girolamo da sarmanetta and the rest to others which being reported by francesco to giorgio whom he asked whether it would be well for him to continue the work that he had begun he received the answer that it would be a good thing after making so many little designs and large cartoons to finish at least one picture notwithstanding that the greater part of the work had been allotted to so many others all much inferior to him and that he should make an effort to approach as near as possible in his work to the pictures by buonarti on the walls and vaulting of the sistine chapel and to those of the Pauline, for the reason that after his work was seen, the others would be thrown to the ground, and all, to his great glory, would be allotted to him. And Giorgio warned him to give no thought to profit or money, or to any vexation that he might suffer from those in charge of the work, telling him that the honor was much more important than any other thing of all these letters and of the replies the originals as well as copies are among those that we ourselves treasure in memory of so great a man who was our dearest friend and among those by our own hand that must have been found among his possessions after these things francesco was living in an angry mood in no way certain as to what he wished to do afflicted in mind feeble in body and weakened by everlasting medicines when finally he fell ill with the illness of death which carried him in a short time to the last extremity without having given him time to make a complete disposal of his possessions to a disciple called Annibale, the son of Nani de Bacchio Bigio, he left sixty crowns a year on the Monte del Farine, fourteen pictures, and all his designs and other art possessions. The rest of his property he left to Suor Gabriella, his sister, a nun, although I understand that she did not receive, as the saying goes, even the cord of the sack. However, there must have come into her hands a picture painted on cloth of silver with embroidery around it, which he had executed for the king of Portugal, 
or of Poland, whichever it was, and left to her to the end, that she might keep it in memory of him. All his other possessions, such as the offices that he had bought after unspeakable fatigues, all were lost. Francesco died on St. Martin's Day, the 11th of November, in the year 1563, and was buried in San Geronimo, a church near the house where he lived. The death of Francesco was a very great loss to art, seeing that, although he was fifty-four years of age and weak in health, he was continually studying and working, cost what it might and at the very last he had set himself to work in mosaic. It is evident that he was capricious and would have liked to do many things, and if he had found a prince who could have recognized his humor and could have given him works after his fancy, he would have achieved marvelous things, for, as we have said, he was rich fertile and most exuberant in every kind of invention, and a master in every field of painting. He gave great beauty and grace to every kind of head, and he understood the nude as well as any other painter of his time. He had a very graceful and delicate manner in painting draperies, arranging them in such a way that the nude could always be perceived in the parts where that was required and clothing his figures in new fashions of dress, and he showed fancy and variety in headdresses, footwear, and every other kind of ornament. He handled colors and oils in distemper and in fresco in such a manner that it may be affirmed that he was one of the most able, resolute, bold, and diligent craftsmen of our age and to this we, who associated with him for so many years, are well able to bear testimony. And although there was always between us a certain proper emulation, by reason of the desire that good craftsmen have to surpass one another, none the less, with regard to the claims of friendship, there was never any lack of love and affection between us, although each of us worked in competition in the most famous places in Italy, as may be seen from a vast number of letters that are in my possession, as I have said, written by the hand of Francesco. Salviati was affectionate by nature, but suspicious, acute, subtle, and penetrative, and yet ready to believe anything and when he set himself to speak of some of the men of our arts, either in jest or in earnest, he was likely to give offense, and at times touch them to the quick. It pleased him to mix with men of learning and great persons, and he always held plebeian craftsmen in detestation, even though they might be able in some field of art. He avoided such persons as always speak evil, and when the conversation turned on them, he would tear them to pieces without mercy. But most of all he abhorred the knaveries that craftsmen sometimes commit, of which, having been in France and having heard something of them, he was only too well able to speak. At times, in order to be less weighed down by his melancholy, he used to mingle with his friends and force himself to be cheerful. But in the end his strange nature, so irresolute, suspicious, and solitary, did harm to no one but himself. His dearest friend was Mano, a Florentine goldsmith in Rome, a man rare in his profession, and excellent in character and goodness of heart. Mano is burdened with a family and if Francesco had been able to dispose of his property, and had not spent all the fruits of his labors on offices, only to leave them to the Pope, he would have left a great part of them to that worthy man and excellent craftsman. Very dear to him, likewise, was the above-mentioned Aveduto del Aveduto a dresser of Miniver furs, who was the most loving and most faithful friend that Francesco ever had, 
and if he had been in Rome when Francesco died, Salvietti would probably have arranged certain of his affairs with better judgment than he did. His disciple also was the Spaniard Rovial, who executed many works in company with him, and by himself an altarpiece containing the conversion of St. Paul for the Church of San Spirito in Rome, and Salviati was very well disposed towards Francesco de Girolamo del Prato, in company with whom, as has been related above, he studied design while still a child, which Francesco was a man of most beautiful genius and drew better than any other goldsmith of his time, and he was not inferior to his father, Girolamo, who executed every kind of work with plates of silver better than any of his rivals. It is said that Girolamo succeeded with ease in any kind of work, Thus, having beaten the plate of silver with certain hammers, he placed it on a piece of plank, and between the two a layer of wax, tallow, and pitch, producing in that way a material midway between soft and hard, and then beating it with iron instruments, both inwards and outwards, he caused it to come out in whatever shapes he desired, heads, breasts, arms, legs, backs, and any other thing that he wished or was demanded from him by those who caused votive offerings to be made, in order to attach them to those holy images that were to be found in any place where they had received favors or had been heard in their prayers. Francesco then, not attending only to the making of votive offerings, as his father did, worked also at Tosia and at inlaying steel with gold and silver after the manner of damaskining, making foliage, figures, and any other kind of work that he wished, in which manner of inlaid work he made a complete suit of armor for a foot soldier of great beauty for Duke Alessandro de' Medici. Among many medals that the same man made, those were by his hand, and very beautiful, which were placed in the foundations of the fortifications at the Porta a Faenza, with the head of the above-named Duke Alessandro together with others, in which there was on one side the head of Pope Clement the Seventh, and on the other a nude Christ with the scourges of his passion. Francesco also delighted in the work of sculpture, and cast some little figures in bronze, full of grace, which came into the possession of Duke Alessandro and the same master polished and carried to great perfection four similar figures made by Bacchio Bandinelli, namely a Leda, a Venus, a Hercules, and an Apollo, which were given to the same duke. Being dissatisfied then with the goldsmith's craft and not being able to give his attention to sculpture, which calls for too many resources, Francesco, having a good knowledge of design, devoted himself to painting, and since he was a person who mixed little with others, and did not care to have it known more than it was inevitable that he was giving his attention to painting, he executed many works by himself. Meanwhile, as was related at the beginning, Francesco Salviati came to Florence, and he worked at the picture for Messer Alamano in the rooms that the other Francesco occupied in the office of works of Santa Maria del Fiore. Wherefore, with that opportunity, seeing Salviati's method of working, he applied himself to painting with much more zeal than he had done up to that time, and executed a very beautiful picture of the conversion of St. Paul which is now in the possession of Guglielmo del Tovaglia. And after that, in a picture of the same size, he painted the serpents raining down on the Hebrew people, and in another he painted Jesus Christ delivering the Holy Fathers from the limbo of hell, 
which two last-named pictures, both very beautiful, now belong to Filippo Spini, a gentleman who much delights in our arts. Besides many other little works that Francesco del Prato executed, he drew much and well, as may be seen from some designs by his hand that are in our book of drawings. He died in the year 1562, and his death much grieved the whole academy, because, besides his having been an able master in art, there was never a more excellent man than Francesco. Another pupil of Francesco Salviati was Giuseppe Porta of Castelnuovo della Garfagnana, who, out of respect for his master, was also called Giuseppe Salviati. This Giuseppe, having been taken to Rome as a boy in the year 1535 by an uncle, the secretary of Monsignor Onofrio Bartolini, Archbishop of Pisa, was placed with Salviati, under whom he learned in a short time not only to draw very finely, but also to use color excellently well. He then went with his master to Venice, where he formed so many connections with noble persons that, being left there by Francesco, he made up his mind that he would choose that city as his home, and so, having taken a wife there, he has lived there ever since, and he has worked in few other places but Venice. He painted long ago the façade of the house of the Loredani on the Campo de San Stefano, with scenes very pleasingly colored in fresco, and executed in a beautiful manner. He painted likewise that of the Bernardi at San Polo, and another behind San Rocco, which is a very good work. Three other façades he has painted in Chioscuro, very large and covered with various scenes, one at San Moisi, the second at San Cassiano, and the third at Santa Maria Zebenigo. He has also painted in fresco at a place called Treville, near Treviso, the whole of the palace of the Priuli, a rich and vast building, both within and without of which building there will be a long account in the life of San Sovino. And at Pieve di Sacco he has painted a very beautiful façade. At Bagnolo, a seat of the friars of San Spirito at Venice, he has executed an altarpiece in oils, and for the same fathers he has painted the ceiling, or rather soffit, of the refectory in the convent of San Spirito with a number of compartments filled with painted pictures, and a most beautiful last supper on the principal wall. For the hall of the doge in the palace of San Marco, he has painted the sibyls, the prophets, the cardinal virtues, and Christ with the Maries, which have won him vast praise. And in the above-mentioned library of San Marco, he painted two large scenes in competition with the other painters of Venice, of whom mention has been made above. Being summoned to Rome by Cardinal Amulio after the death of Francesco, he finished one of the larger scenes that are in the Hall of Kings, and began another. And then, Pope Pius the Fourth, having died, he returned to Venice, where the Signoria commissioned him to paint a ceiling with pictures in oils, which is at the head of the new staircase in the palace. The same master has painted six very beautiful altar pieces in oils, one of which is on the altar of the Madonna in San Francesco della Vigna, the second on the high altar in the Church of the Servites, the third is with the Friars Minors, the fourth in the Madonna dell'Orto, the fifth at San Zaccaria, and the sixth at San Moise, and he has painted two at Murano, which are beautiful and executed with much diligence and in a lovely manner. 
but of this Giuseppe, who is still alive, and is becoming a very excellent master, I say no more for the present, save that, in addition to his painting, he devotes much study to geometry. By his hand is the volute of the Ionic capital that is to be seen in print at the present day, showing how it should be turned after the ancient measure, and there is to appear soon a work that he has composed on the subject of geometry. A disciple of Francesco also was one Domenico Romano, who was of great assistance to him in the hall that he painted in Florence and in other works. Domenico engaged himself in the year 1550 to Signor Giuliano Cesarino, and he does not work on his own account. <laughs> 